It's no Well, hello again. We're back. Nice try, whoever that was. Let me add everyone back in again. First, I'll start with Marua today. Hi, hello Marua. again. Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> okay, and next will be Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Welcome back. <laughs> and let me get Lindsay last but not least. Hello, hello Lindsay. Well, that was interesting. Um, for the people that are out there, excuse me, and can't see us, uh, we were pulled off air for breaching community standards. We don't know exactly what those community standards were, and I've appealed it. I think it might have something to do with using the T word, so we won't be doing that. Um, we will continue, however, to discuss what we were going to discuss today. Is everybody okay with that? Sure. All right. So what we're discussing is the use of ATPs, um, as a harm reduction tool. Now, the reason I wanted to have this panel and have this presentation was, as many of us know, there is a big divide within the community between people who use e-liquid vaping and people who use other harm reduced products. And I think one of the things that we can try to do is to bring everyone together and to understand that all the tools that are in the toolbox are all valid and all effective. And that's why I've chosen the people that I've chosen today. I would like to, if possible, I'd like to start with you, Madawa, if it's at all possible, because you're the snus person. And, you know, we've had a couple of presentations now on snus. And I think a lot of people don't actually understand it and its harm reduced quality. So could you kind of give us a brief on that in you from your research? Okay, well, I haven't actually researched SNUS, but I have lobbied for, um, hi, Lindsay and Jenna, <laughs> lovely to see you again. I have uh, lobbied in New Zealand for what was like 10 years as the chair of In Smoking NZ um, and an academic, lobbied for New Zealand people who smoke to have access to Swedish SNUS. Now, the regulations at that time, we all believed, uh, banned the import of oral um, ATP products um, for import, for sale, importing for sale and distribution. You could import for your own use, but it was taxed at the same rate that um, the standard products everyone uses um, so the tax was the same so it's a very heavy tax and one person in New Zealand who was importing for his own use really that as the tax went up and up it became prohibitive and he I'm not sure that he was able to continue so SNUS has been around and been used in uh, the Scandinavian countries and the um, indigenous Sami people uh, right across the Arctic and into Russia. So across the top of Sweden, Finland, Norway, and into the Kola Peninsula of Russia. The Sami people who are the indigenous people of that Sami land uh, have been using um, the snuff earlier, snuff form that Bengt showed yesterday and has very good presentation. And then, and then it was packaged into the small tea bag like packs, uh, mm -hmm. packages uh, for convenience and sort of dose size uh, use packets. And we have seen, and, and look, this has been, we've known this for 30 years, the evidence has been there that uh, smoking prevalence had dropped right off in those countries. And so did the smoking related harm, the disease rates incidence of the smoking related diseases and um, and the longevity rate of people who mm -hmm. who had switched from smoking or who who never smoked but just used the uh, the Swedish SNUS products so the evidence was absolutely clear uh, that there was there was less harm however as as is the case today there 
there was a constant stream of scientific journal articles and research done by people either um, really believing the fact that that it was no better, that it was as harmful as continuing to smoke cigarettes and or they deliberately wanted to portray Swedish snus as equally harmful. Um, because we're talking about safer and you may have already covered it today, but I have problem with the terms that are being used, if I can just mention that. I mean, in yeah, public no, health, fine, go for it. Mm -hmm. In public health, we, you know, so in the Public Health Commission where I used to work uh, 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, there was an injury prevention analyst, so the policy analyst that did injury prevention, and there was uh, Dr. Murray Logerson who did tobacco control. What we were focused on and what public health used to be focused on was reduction of disease and and early early death so morbidity and mortality that was the focus and what you what we looked for as analysts were what what was associated with causing those uh, diseases uh, what behavioral what were the risks um, what were the determinants of the behaviors that led to it like smoking and what were the risks so I, I tend to use the term risk reduced products. The term harm, harm is really, you know, oh, I fell over and I gashed my leg. That's a harm or an injury. Um, and your video you showed, I think on Monday, of people wearing a helmet when they ride a motorbike to reduce, reduce their risk of harm. So there's, what's, there's risk of harm. It doesn't mean that harm occurs is, is the distinction I really want to make. So when we talk about products being harm reduced, uh, we're really saying that you will, you will suffer less harm if you use this product. In actual fact, for many of the um, very low risk products, the risk, it's really the risk of harm occurring. That's what we should be measuring when we're looking at products. What is the risk of harm? It isn't that harm will necessarily result from that use. Uh, another thing, and I especially see this in the vaping advocacy community. Uh, in fact, the vaping advocacy Kissy community do a lot of tobacco control promotion and and promotion about stopping smoking and encouraging people to quit. And they often like post, you know, smoking kills and 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 vaping saved our lives and and everything like that. In actual fact, the research that existed, uh, Richard Pito's and and Hill, the Helen Pito, all of that old research that was done. Now that big study was a longitudinal study based on male doctors in the 1950s. People don't smoke like that anymore. And there's a lot of research yep. that shows there's a dose response relationship. Not mm -hmm. everyone, 100% of people who pick up a cigarette and smoke don't die, okay? Only it's, a, it's related to how much you smoke how long you smoke, how intensely you drag in and hold it in over the many years. So the people who are really at high risk are people who um, start younger and have a longer career smoking, if we call it that. People who smoke heavy, like people with schizophrenia tend to smoke very heavily. And, and then you have people who smoke intensely like that drag it in, they hold it in. Um, so risk is risk differs across the population of people who may use the products. And I think that that has been completely um, shoved to the side, sidelined as a fact. And what we had to kind of do that in tobacco control because 
we couldn't get media coverage. You know, you like have to constantly come out with something yeah. new, some new fact. How do you get cut through? There's so much competition and it's even greater now, the competition for airspace and to be heard. And of course, influence comes with that. So I prefer to talk about risk reduced uh, products. Many of them, um, the harm, the risk of harm is actually, or, or the actual harm that occurs is so much lower. And that's where we get this 95% safer figure or the 98% safer. Now, again, saying something is safer implies that, well, you are going to be harmed, um, but instead of breaking your leg, you're just going to stub your toe or, and I knew use that, uh, I wrote an essay because Stan Glantz uh, is one example and other local advocates here yeah. used to say smoking is like, um, is like falling from the 10th story of a building. And sometimes they would say it's like falling from the 50th story of a building. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Dr. Carl Phillips had done some study looking at, okay, let's look at that analogy of people falling off a building. Not everybody who say falls from the fourth floor, the fourth story dies, um, you know, depends how you fall on the pavement. So I think that we could, we could advance how we talk about risk reduced products or low harm products, have a little bit more nuance around it. Um, it isn't a hundred percent of people who die and people who smoke will always tell you, well, my nanny, she smoked until she was 98. And, you know, and then there's these other people who have lived into their hundreds and they say, yeah. right, what kept you alive? Oh, my cigarette, you know? And so, plus a red wine. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, the Hill saying. and Pito study on UK doctors came out with the earlier you start, the longer you smoke, the more likely you are, and that is a risk, the more likely you are to die of a smoking related okay. disease. And, and then we used to say about half, actually, and it came from that same research, about half of people who smoke will die from a smoking related disease. And another uh, colleague, he did some work around that. He thought it was more like two thirds. So we used to use imagery like the gun, you know, yeah. spinning Russian roulette, you spin, spin, you know, and then mm -hmm. three bullets in the, so, in the chamber. So what you're saying is it's almost like the, the, the discussions that we had five years ago when we would say, don't say quit, switch, because language can influence people's perception of what they're, they want to do. It, we, remove the negativity, I guess is the best way of putting it. Sorry, I'm still really upset about what just happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I wanna ask, I wanna start with Lindsay, if I can. Lindsay, I know that you vape and you also use a heated tobacco product. You use both, correct? Well, I used to, but you can't really get the heat sticks here. Well, now, yeah. And, now and they actually, um, I, I got to see them in the first gas station ever in the States when I went traveling around, actually. So I'm in uh, North Carolina. I was like, it's pretty amazing. But then you know how with the ITC shut them out too. So unless they have, you know, the trade commission comes back and lets them have a stay. Okay. But they were amazing. Um, I mean, especially for people who cannot use an e, you know, an e-cigarette to get off cigarettes. Um, you know, some people like the combustion of, you know, smoking, knowing that it's really harmful. And I think it mimics the way that it mimics a cigarette is a lot better than what, you know, an e-cigarette can provide for people. Yeah, it tastes like a cigarette, which is going to actually make me jump over to Jenna, because when I first met Jenna, she used to smoke and she doesn't smoke anymore. Jenna is a heated tobacco user. Jenna, are you there? Oh, we lost both yes, of them. Hi, no, hi. Jenna. Yeah. Hi. Hi. When we met, I think you remember this. When we met, you used to smoke and then That's you switched true. to heated tobacco and we, you and I. And you and I had a discussion about the perception of women smoking in the Philippines. And one of the questions I wanted to ask, but that I didn't ask was, 
do you see a lot of Filipino women who used to smoke now using heated tobacco simply because it's more discreet and it's more acceptable? Um, there are a lot of women who have switched to HTDs mainly because of the smell that a uh, combustible cigarette uh, gives out. And using heated tobacco products, um, the, the, the smell um, dissipates um, very quickly. And in fact, you could hardly smell it at all um, after just a few seconds. So I think that's one of the main things that women consider, plus also the pressure from, from relatives to stop smoking because of the dangers of combustible cigarettes. Now, you've been using a heated tobacco mm -hmm. product, if I remember correctly, now about two or three years now. How do you feel? Correct. Have you noticed the change? Uh, a lot better, Nancy. Um, I, I actually feel fitter. And um, everything's lighter, actually. Because when I was uh, smoking combustible cigarettes, I could barely um, catch up with my son when we walk together so now i have uh, a better fighting chance to you know join him in those walks yeah see you you definitely look a hell of a lot better and a lot younger too i might add i have noticed the difference because you know smokers get we ate you know when people smoke they age really fast you've kind of done yeah. the whole reverse thing yeah, yeah. full credit thank you, um, thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, you're younger than all of us, and that's okay, child. Um, do you see oh, a back. lot of young... It's all right, I know. Do you see, before they actually pulled IQOS off the market in the States, did you see a lot of younger women switching to IQOS, or was it an issue of the money? What was the situation Not really. There? Honestly, you don't see it in the States, because they only had it in three markets. So they had it in like a couple places in North Carolina, Atlanta, and... They rolled it out in like Northern Virginia. Um, but when I noticed when I went to foreign countries that you didn't see a lot of women, you saw a lot of men. When I was in Dubai um, earlier, you know, in September, I saw a lot of heat not burn there and it was a lot of males that were actually using it. But men still okay. disproportionately smoke more in the States anyways. It's not as, it's not as bad as other countries yeah. where it's like really disproportionately male, but it's still, they tend to smoke more. Nancy, can I come in there? Because I was part of a study tour yes. to Japan with Ricardo and uh, you know a number of others. And we actually got to take part in a focus group with Japanese uh, people who used the products there. So at that time, there were three, the um, Philip Morris, ICOS, the British American Tobacco um, Glow product, which was a heated tobacco HTP and and then there was the Japanese plume tech now that was absolutely fascinating that Japan tobacco which is government owned had come out with their own version of uh, electronic cigarette um, and as you, I'm not sure if you have covered this but in Japan they absolutely could not your know, nicotine products on their own apart from the medicinal ones were banned under you know an old law and similar to what Australia has so we actually also met with the Minister of Finance we could not tell him anything about vaping he knew it all he honestly was very well read on the topic and very very concerned about the high rates of smoking among particularly Japanese men. So the heated tobacco product was defined as a tobacco product as long as it had tobacco in it. I don't know if you know about the plume tech, but it is like a, yeah. it's, it's like a, uh, one of those old vape sticks. Um, it it's actually like has the- um, e It's like the cigalite. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, n a bit be the next one up, you know, the, yeah. yeah, the next version. I had one. I had one yeah. with the tank mm -hmm. and the battery, but it yeah. also had a via a tank that had e-liquid in it, but it also 
and the user would, when they draw in, it would pull the vapor through a plug of tobacco. So because it had tobacco in it, it could be defined as a tobacco product. Very, very clever. And at the airport there, you know, the uh, where everything, all the duty-free products are for sale and the stands of all of these products are at the airport. Um, and the Korean tobacco company, KTNG, also had by that stage come out with their own version too, and that's the Lil brand. So they were, they were all there at the airport promoting and the salespeople, the young saleswomen would stand outside and I was looking and they went, this is an electronic cigarette. And I'm like, oh really, <laughs> this is an electronic cigarette. Yeah. So, I had that experience too. Yeah, in the focus group, um, I definitely got the impression that the ICOS was quite weak. There were some people who had been like chain smokers. And so what they were doing was buying two because it has a time delay on it. You can only use it for a certain amount of time, as you know, of course, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And and then it, you can't use it again until it cool, the whole device cools down. And so this guy bought two so he could he could uh, use them back to back and things like that were happening. I really came away from that feeling that the level of nicotine was set very low, in fact, too low. And at first, um, a lot of lighter smokers were able to switch to these products, but not so much, I think, not so much probably the heavy smokers. That annoyed me. If you're going to come out with a product, make it effective for everyone, yeah. not just light smokers. And just to bring a stat in there, um, it's now been about four years and 37% of the people who smoked in Japan have switched to HTP products. That is uh, the most rapid mass exodus yeah. from one product to another, not even cigarettes, but you name it, as um, David Sweeney explains. Mm -hmm. This is a very rapid transition yeah. to a new innovative product. And in Korea as well. And one of the things we did, a we did a little um, field trip to Tokyo, um, a few of us from CAFRA. And we met with people, um, we went to an ICO store, we went to a plume store. We also met with BAT. So we actually got to see all three of those products that were available. And I mean, it's not for me, it's not my bag, but you know, it, I'm okay with it, obviously. But one of the, the points, the main points that came through to me in talking to those people was that in the culture, in the Japanese culture, it was it considered more, um, how do I put it? less intrusive. You know, when you're walking down the street with a cigarette and you've got the head and you could burn somebody or, or, or you know, a little kid or something. Whereas if you have this, okay, like Jenna said, you don't have the smell and then you don't have the, the, the head, the, you know, the ember at the end. So it's, it's more, um, it's less intrusive, I guess, yeah. is the word. Which and I was think very culturally that... inappropriate in Japan to yes. intrude okay. upon other people in such a way. So it really was, as Jenna said, that lack of smell. Uh, you didn't, weren't creating ash. Um, and in Tokyo, they, they actually banned you. weren't allowed to walk along the street and smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of that. So it, it, was, it was a great lesson in terms of why with the framework convention, FCTC, countries are left with enough room to tailor the uh, guidelines to their local culture. And Japan is a very good example of how the messages to get people to quit smoking focus on very different aspects, not so much a personal person's risk to their own health, but risk to, or, or really it's more that public shame and not intruding on anybody else. It's that politeness and respect for others. Hey, Jenna. That's the collective verse. Yes. It's the collective Actually, versus the individual. Jenna? Yeah. When, when I switched to uh, HTPs from combustible cigarettes, I was very conscious about the secondhand smoke that I was giving out using combustibles. And uh, Dr. Glover is correct that, you know, there is none of that when you use HTP because secondhand smoke, which is smoke, environmental tobacco, which is an environmental tobacco smoke, is a combination of smoke produced from the lit end of the cigarette and from the um, 
from exhalation, exhalation uh, from the smokers. And I don't get that. I don't give out that secondhand smoke when I use HTPs. Yeah. Lindsay, thoughts? Thoughts? Well, going back to Japan, um, just some efficacy. I know that Japan Tobacco released their third quarter report, and they've actually had a decrease in cigarette sales and an increase in their alternative products, um, including e-cigarettes and HDPs. And I thought it was really interesting because that report kind of coincided with the report that came out in the United States where we had an increase in cigarette sales. And they were kind of like blaming COVID. And it's like, well, COVID has happened everywhere else. You know, look at Japan here. Um, and it'd be interesting to look at more countries and seeing the liberal approach that they have done to these safer products, um, you know, and how has it, especially I think the COVID pandemic, because you did see an increase in just a lot of, you know, stress relievers mm -hmm. for people, I think paints a really good backdrop in order to get that research to see, you know, did people use more of a safer product or did they use, you know, combustible cigarettes more? Yeah, so I actually down there. I actually um, am putting a paper in very shortly, reporting on our coping and lockdown study. And we, we uh, included the US and India, New Zealand and Russia. Um, it was a cross country. Well, we, we can't compare the countries because they're very, very different in terms of their response to the COVID pandemic. But we were looking at did it change people's uh, use of cigarettes, um, alternative products, and alcohol and other drugs? So just from that small online survey, cross-sectional, it was during the first lockdown last year. Uh, yeah. And it isn't, I don't think it is true that people, um, what did they say that people increase their smoking prevalence? We, we definitely didn't find that. It's kind of some did, but some quit and some stayed the same. And and so I don't, I don't think that the evidence is gonna support that. Maybe further on, maybe like now with, with um, more lockdown, with extended lockdowns and with, you know, with the a lot of the other political changes that are being brought in on the back of COVID, uh, and it's being used now to to change a lot of things, as we saw with our regulations here, and um, to keep people out. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it was that at all, Lindsay. I think your analysis of the situation and what you guys have been putting out is is probably more correct. It was unintended negative effects of poor policy poor tobacco control policy they made a huge mistake and more than any of us they are supporting smoking to continue they are supporting the tobacco industry to continue to thrive and to experience very little drop off in their sales unfortunately oh, absolutely I mean, and well, the, yeah, the research that I've done too, uh, 2020, if you look at U.S. smoking prevalence, it's actually been, it's decreased. So yes, sales went up, but that, you know, the amount of people smoking has not gone up either. So just, you know, paying attention to that. And I think, yeah, the data is going to show it's uh, it's always, you know, continuing to decline everywhere. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things too is that, you know, in Japan, and I remember this too, and H just reminded me, you know, we were actively offered it. You know, try this, try this, try this, like Sorry. you said. I mean, in restaurants, we were in, you know, I remember one restaurant, they came up, you want to try this? It was like, um. It was like the know, free I, cigarette people here in the States. Right. I remember that from when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, they're more open and talking about harm reduction there. I mean, I, I presume that it's because the product, that the products that they sell there, you know, they also have the JT product, like um, Matua said, the plume, which I had and I loved it, um, by the way. And, you know, they had the BAT product, the glow, and they had the ICO stores everywhere. You know, it's an accept, harm reduction is an accepted concept there. And I, I think it shows that both Korea and mainly Japan, it shows that if a government really accepts and promotes harm reduction, they can actually activate that in their people. And that's a big problem that we're having right now. I mean, for example, I know that in the Philippines, we're all waiting on tenterhooks to see what's going to happen. 
Jenna, can you see the same thing that happened in, in Japan happen in the Philippines if this goes through? Well, I hope that's going to happen because currently there are about 87 million Filipinos who die due to smoking combustible cigarettes. And the, uh, the need for the concept of THR to be accepted by our public policy makers and um, the DOH, the Department of Health, um, it, it, has to be, it has to be done. And hopefully that will happen if, if we do the right thing in disseminating information about the concept of THR. So what do you think, how do you think government should go about promoting this to consumers so that they realize that it's a viable option? Because there's so much information out there telling people, and we've dealt with this in New Zealand as well, and they're dealing with it in the States right now as well, um, that, you know, it's so bad. You know, we only get the negative information. We only get, you know, popcorn lung and all of that crap still happening. So how would you envision, I'm going to ask this one of Mottawa and then quickly I want to hear what Lindsay has to say because the U.S. is so completely foreign to everybody else. How would you envision a government promoting that? Thank you. So in New Zealand, the, uh, the government, actually the previous government, they had designed a quit uh, campaign. Uh, they, they had designed already a vaping fax website. Now that has been designed by the health sponsorship, well, used to be health sponsorship council is now um, called the health promotion agency. It's a crown agency set up under the Smoke Free Environments Act 1990. And their, their role is social marketing to promote healthy, um, you know, behavior change. And so they had designed a vaping fax website and and a whole campaign and now we've had the vape to quit strong campaign now those are government ministry of health well government campaigns government information sites and in our voices of the five percent study we always ask if anyone's seen any ads and a recent participant i was interviewing um I asked her if she'd seen the vape to quit strong. She thought she had. I said, did you know that that's a government campaign? She was like, oh, no, I don't think it would be a government. So there's been so much misinformation that even some people who smoke in New Zealand think that the Vaping Facts website, which is a crown agency government funded campaign to encourage people to switch from smoking if they can't quit, to switch from smoking, it's okay to use vaping. Um, and and some people here don't believe that it's a government funded or supported campaign. They think that it's tobacco industry. That's they're being and so they don't trust it. And of course, don't trust anything that comes out of the tobacco industry, of course. But that isn't um, so the misinformation is really damaging perceptions of um, and blocking people from even thinking that that could be government. government. Government needs to be very clear to answer your question, needs to be very, very clear, like Public Health England is being. Uh, they need to say this is the government position. We have had members of parliament who passed the, um, the act on public, on TV, say, you know, this is, this is a reduced risk option and we do want people to do this. We'd rather you do this than vaping, but they need to be clear clear messages, repeat it. Um, but they're kind of mixing the message because they say, do this to quit. And then we want you to quit that as well, because it's not harmless. It's not, you know. Lens? I mean, short answer, subsidize them. Um, you know, I mean, if you it, really, if you want to approach, you know, tobacco, harm reduction in the states uh definitely but th obviously that would never happen in the united states first things first make it so that they're regulated but not in the way that the fda has regulated them that makes this process you know impossible um for any of the smaller people to get through they're still waiting on you know applications for their pmtas i mean jewel still doesn't even have their pmta authorized yet um, and the way that the FDA has treated them, I think, has put a major barrier, in, especially for any of the new products. And it's such a really ridiculous process, too. Like, take ICOS, for example. They have a PMTA that got authorized back in 2020. 
but they can't bring in a new one unless they can't bring in an updated version of this good unless they go through the whole process again and spend millions of dollars. Um, and I think what, you know, Dr. Glover says too, this whole education, you know, do educate the public on this continuum of harm that exists in tobacco products and with, you know, combustible cigarettes being the most harmful and then down the spectrum and even NRT here in the States, they do subsidize nicotine replacement therapy, the quit lines. We know that they're notoriously ineffective at helping smokers quit. So actually start, you know, investing money into programs that do help smokers quit. And then finally, if you're going to tax these, because that's been a big issue. Um, if you're following what's going on at the federal level of the states, they, you know, dropped a first, they dropped a cigarette and a vape tax and cigar tax. Then they took everything out but the vape tax and they have it on parity um with actually it's going to be worse than what the, ta the federal taxes on a pack of 20 uh cigarettes so if you're going to tax it make sure that it, it you know represents the harm and that it's not being paired with combustible cigarettes or even cigars um that you're recognizing that but i'm never going to go on the record for saying tax it i think once again you should be subsidizing it Oh, yeah, and making no, them available understood. wherever cigarettes are as well if cigarettes are, be are being sold there Vape should be being well. Any other tobacco harm reduction products should be able to be sold there. That's the thing that twists my knickers so much here in New Zealand is that you can get tobacco anywhere, but if you go and like say it's the middle of the night, right, and you need a you know vape juice or something, and you wind up having to go to the gas station, the petrol station, you're stuck with menthol mint and tobacco. Why? The thing that's going to you know cause more harm that has more risk. Ottawa has more risk is readily available everywhere but the thing that is reduced risk is controlled why is that I still you know and then now we look at what's going on in Australia where you need a script I, yeah logic, because it, it defies logic yeah New Zealand is planning to remove the sale of tobacco from dairies are uh, they the you know, lobbies, the prohibitionists are lobbying very hard for that. So the last thing they wanted to do was allow your know, vaping products to be sold there as well. Um, you know, they pretty much had to do that. Otherwise, people in rural areas uh, would would not have access to vaping products uh, and they still don't have equi equitable access. So the the prohibitionists here are going for complete prohibition, banning the import and sale of cigarettes altogether. So they don't want uh, to expand the range of products in any way. They had to with vaping because the horse had bolted. You couldn't, you, you couldn't reverse what had happened. So many people were switching to vaping so rapidly here um, that you know, it was undeniable that they needed to legislate, uh, they needed to regulate it. But that regulation, the intent is to denormalize vaping. The intent is what we call a sinking lid policy. So they will, they will strangle access over the years. Uh, the next focus is to get rid of combustible tobacco altogether. And that's very, very tricky and world trade agreements and uh, trade laws, international trade laws and new, many laws New Zealand has, but they're working on it. They're looking at a whole range of things, um, reducing the amount that can be imported each year into the country, trying to get them out of, out of low, you know, convenience stores, corner stores, petrol stations. And then all you would be left with in those places would be your mint, mint mint menthol and uh, tobacco flavored e-liquid or, or electronic cigarette vaping equipment and the the icos is still for sale here although I, I don't think anyone there's hardly anyone that uses it as far as i know it's and it's a bit expensive so with our long history of tobacco control smoking is really concentrated among lower income people um, and a high a high cost product is not accessible is that yeah i see yeah i see a lot of people using heated tobacco the iquos which is what we have in new zealand um 
in downtown CBD. It's more, you know, it, it is. It's more higher income. It's also um, mostly used by people that have come over from Asia, and that's what they use there, and that's why they use it here. So, yeah. I mean, and the price point is ridiculous. It, it doesn't offer a benefit for those people that might benefit from it that are using combustible because they just can't afford it. Now, Jenna, I remember when I was the last in Manila, the last time I was overseas, um, that tobacco was available at 18, but vape was 21. Does the new regulation actually straighten that out and make everything either 18 or 21? Oh, um, we're... We're, at the moment, anyone can can buy combustible cigarette. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar about the concept of Sari Sari store, which is essentially a small store which you can find in every neighborhood. And while the government says that, you know, uh, the sellers or the owners cannot sell to minors, I think the problem persists that when young people try to buy cigarettes the, the the enforcement of that rule is not followed at all because there's just millions of sari sari stores in the philippines um they can enforce that rule in uh, small convenience stores like 7-eleven many stop but there's no way they can control the neighborhood stores selling cigarettes and soft drinks. Um, hopefully that will change. Hopefully um, uh, the law will uh, allow um, people below 21 to have access to less harmful alternatives if they are smokers. Um, yeah, yeah but, but we have we still have to see if that's going to happen. Because as I mentioned, 87,000 Filipinos who die every year due to smoking cigarettes is just not acceptable. And, and the government has to do something about it. They have to tell the people that there are less harmful alternatives for them. And people just have to know so that they can make informed choices because if these choices are made known to the smokers we have in the Philippines, I think a lot of people will switch. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Lindsay, in the States, thanks for that, Jenna. Lindsay, in the States, um, is it still, is it is it 21 for smoking? Or have they, have they, has everybody gone 21 smoking? Because I remember when it was 18. It's federal, yes, but not all the states have gone with it. So that's where you'll see some of the really wonky state bills come out because they're pushing the T21 and they'll package other stuff. So last year, the flavor ban bill in Florida, that was originally supposed to be a T21 bill. Um, but it was the President Trump actually uh, signed the T21, but it's federally enforced. Um, but whether they do anything about it, you know, has yet to be seen. Okay. I mean, in the States, I know they will never, excuse me, they will never ban tobacco. I mean, they grow it. They're not going to ban it. Um, yeah. I think they grow it in the Philippines too, right, Jenna? Yes. Yeah. So this question is probably more for Madawa. Is if um, they go ahead with this plan with, you know, first they're going to start with the very low nicotine cigarettes and then, and then phase out tobacco available commercially, the projection on the black market and then the harm from that will be exponential on that will just throw 2025 right out the window won't it you're muted sorry we're not going to get to 2025 um and only some groups um high income uh, people living in richer areas that already only have three percent prevalence there so um you know low income people um the indigenous people pacific island people people with mental health uh, will not get to five percent so the prohibitionists are going for zero percent that's what they're pushing they're trying to get the whole country to believe that smoke free 2025 is about having a smoke free country completely smoke free and that was the five percent um was picked out of a hat so it wasn't based on evidence 
we had a 1996 sort of survey smoking prevalence data from the census so they were able to look by occupation and we could see that from that data that only 3% of medical doctors smoked and only 3% of church ministers smoked. So that kind of led to, well, it's achievable. So, you know, 3%, not everyone's a doctor, not everyone's a church minister, maybe we'll go for five. And it's talked about actually in government documents as an aspirational goal. It is not evidence-based. Um, from my personal experience, you know, of 30 years and my expertise in smoking cessation, the links with, um, you know, much higher smoking rates among some some of people with some of the mental health conditions, I think will be, you know, what would be achievable? Ten, maybe, um, maybe ten, maybe we're there. You know, Australia is already claiming that they're down to is it twelve percent daily smoking. Uh, I think that that's probably it. And of course, Australia has a much larger black market. We have the the benefit of being a, a long way away from our nearest neighbor yeah. um three hour flight and three days by sea um so it is not easy for contraband tobacco to get into new zealand we have a very strong border force uh, border control and this is why we saw a huge uptick or a sharp uptick in robberies of convenience stores for tobacco so so the corner stores that uh, that sell tobacco some alcohol stores and petrol stations as well and we had this phenomenon happen like the wild wild west like the bank robberies yeah, in the wild wild west uh, where you know car there were people were stealing cars and driving into the front of shops cigarettes became it was referred to like gold um it was easy to carry they were light you could carry a lot of cigarettes out of the shop if you've got a few of you and they were selling those uh, and a, the black market kind of took off then um also yep marx is talking about chop chop and um so chop chop is homegrown now i believe in australia they banned you're not allowed to grow your own tobacco uh, in new zealand it used to be you could grow 15 kilos of dry weight a year for your own use. And then every time there's an amendment to the law and it was slipped through with no one even knowing in the customs law, they reduced that from 15% to five, um, sorry, 15 kilos to five. And I think that that, that would definitely be a sneaky thing that they'll be targeting because Chugga mentioned about the black market and people will grow their own. Um, it's not easy to grow as such, you know, in, it's, it's probably easy enough to grow. It's the actual curing and curing. stopping it from going moldy. So it's not a really yeah. big thing here. What has taken off is the contraband coming in from overseas. Um, so there will be increased enforcement, increased fines on that. The low nicotine cigarettes you mentioned, that big lobbying to say all the combustibles, that the nicotine content has to be reduced to 0.5% or below. Now that is virtually nothing, you know, virtually nothing. So when you you know many people think oh well that will just cause people to smoke more they won't smoke more if there's no nicotine there although some people still smoke herbal cigarettes but if there's no nicotine what we'll have is people will be trying to add nicotine they'll be buying nicotine and being trying to add it into the cigarettes that have no that don't have enough nicotine in them um, I mean, they'll be doing what they do in prison here, which is get patches and soak yeah. the nicotine out of all and, sorts yeah. of very creative things. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's see, we've got people, uh, we've got 16.8% for Australia, by the way, as the smoking rate. And it has, it, I believe it has been going up. Pippa, you can tell me if that, Pippa and Paul can tell me or Bruni. Um, Bruni is saying we can't, Australia, you're not allowed to grow your own. It's a two year process to cure tobacco for it to actually be pleasurable. Um, and then Mallory's talking about vapors stocking up on liters of nicotine and stuff in the DIY community. 
Um, and, and then, of course, we have age. The reason you're not allowed to grow tobacco is because the government wants to get their tax cut from every leaf. In Thailand, 50% of the market is reportedly chop chop, untaxed and unregulated, which is interesting. I know that here in New Zealand, there is a pretty big growing um, people that grow. They grow in Wairapa, they grow in Taranaki, and I think they also grow it down in Nelson down there. The, the, but the curing is the problem. And some people have gotten very, very sick from it. And that's the problem with a ban. And that's, you know, like what's going to prob probably happen in Australia and it's going to happen here when they eventually start banning things is people are going to be sick. So they're going to institute a ban, say it's for the benefit of public health, and then they're going to cause more public harm. And then yeah. they're just going to turn around and say, yep. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of anybody getting sick from it. Uh, one of our voices of the 5% study participants grows his own. He grows enough for to last him all year. And then he buys a packet of cigarettes every now and then as a treat. So that's a treat. But, you know, so there, there are definitely some people growing it. Um, there's a Tongan tobacco, it's called, which is sold mm -hmm. on the black market here. Uh, I don't know if it, the plant is actually from Tonga. A Pacific Island um, and therefore it might be a chewing tobacco rather than a smoking tobacco but um, yeah the, the main problem is keeping it from going moldy the mold has bacteria the mold is a risk to health so it's really that sort of thing and then people have give it a go and then they find they have to keep it in a fridge and or, or try and you know keep it from going moldy um, yeah okay all right um final discussion and I think we're going to switch to what just happened. I want your thoughts on what just happened when we got blown off the air. Jenna, thoughts? Muted. Jenna, you're muted. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's, it's okay. terrible because withholding information um, is the essence of tyranny, as someone said. And for people to um, stop smoking, um, they should be given all the options, all the information that they need. And the government should be the key uh, factor in charge of making sure that people have the right information bef and then make this less harmful alternatives accessible to them. And you know, stopping us from um, giving information or educating the public, especially the smokers, about the options that they have, it's not on. And I think this has to change and misinformation also has to be corrected. Um, so we just have to try harder as advocates and, you know, convince policy makers to adopt tobacco harm reduction. Just have to keep going, pretty yeah. much. Just have to keep going. Lindsay, in an American context, what's your take on what just happened? I think they were afraid because it's a panel full of women. <laughs> and we could get everything done. Um, but uh, I'm not surprised by it, quite honestly. I, I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. Um, and, you know, with the people watching it, I know I, I was talking to Nancy earlier, especially, you know, thank you for having me on here. As well. I think it's wonderful what y'all are doing and the amount of attention that this live stream is getting. And it's just going to be beautiful, especially over the next two years as we prepare for COP10. But um, I mean, I'm used to it in the States. I mean, if we go back to the Eve Ally stuff, you know, back in the, the vaping related lung injury that, you know, went around the world, even though it was literally only in the States, you had the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that were actively downplaying the role of illicit products that contain tetrahydrocannabinol or THC in it. Um, even though many of us that were advocates and, you know, and just people that were, you know, watching what was going on was telling them it's dank baits. It's this fake weed brand that's out there. And it took them till December. So I'm, you know, here in the States, we are used to the misinformation, um, especially with the way that our government agencies is. So just, you know, keep pushing back. We have had the very, you know, we, we had the one moment, it was two years ago today when we had the We Vape, We Vote rally out in DC and Donald Trump tweeted at us and 
you know, was supposed to be a full blown fl flavor ban and that didn't happen. We've got a lot of movers and shakers that are doing work, um, you know, getting companies past this, this draconian PMTA and just, you know, moving forward. Um, it, it's, it's not great, but it's not really bad. But yeah, at, screw YouTube. We should just go on Parlor. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> um, Madawa, yesterday I asked you about what your comment would be for the people, the delegates at COP9, and you said resign. Do you still feel that way? <laughs> yep, I think I think that the Framework uh, Convention on Tobacco Control Secretariat has been co-opted and uh, by prohibitionists, and and they've they've gradually been um, recruiting and and you know brainwashing people. Controlling information is very it's essential to that. If you want to control the citizens. And or control anyone. It's it's about controlling their thoughts and their beliefs and their attitudes. You must control what what information they're going to be getting. Um, we you know I mean that's only just very very obvious now with what's happening, what's been happening in New Zealand with the uh, response to COVID, and I, as a, with psychology training behind me, I have been absolutely. Just, um, I keep going, where are the psychologists? Why isn't everybody, well, why is nobody saying this, this is, is propaganda 101. This is so basic, the, the rhetorical strategies, the communication strategies, the control of information, the suppression of competing information, or, and then the attack on medical doctors threatening to to remove their license to practice, uh, let alone, you know, my own experience, which I talked about um, yesterday and the blacklisting of, of a researcher and uh, not allowing people to read my research. Um, the Prohibitionists in Tobacco Control, it's an international network. Actually, I see them as a minority in tobacco control, but they, they and they're not using honest, um, ethical and professional behaviors to achieve their takeover and their control. So um, the honest, ethical people haven't had the tools to protect science. Uh, they, they don't want to respond in the same way. They want to behave in a professional way. We want to behave in a professional way. You can't fight an abuser by turning the other cheek, um, they just hit you again. And I actually, I did used to work in um, male violence against women and women's refuge and rape crisis. So I have, I have kind of uh, been surprised by the, the parallels with the behavior of violent partners. And it's very like that, how it's um, structured um, and all of the strategies that are used. So shutting down, um, you know, as soon as they would do everything in their power to shut down any platform you use um, and anyone who participates or speaks on it will come in for attack. And of course, we know that Bloomberg uh, funded a whole group at the University of Bath in the UK and they got $20 million to sit there every day and attack and sabotage any work being done by tobacco harm reductionists to defame tobacco harm reduction academics. Um, you know, they write to, you know, I'm an editor of the tobacco section for the harm reduction journal. They have written to the editor of that journal twice, complaining and bullying him to sack me. Um, and, Go, Lindsay. you know, they wrote to the New Zealander of the Year, Kiwi Bank New Zealander of the Year committee and demanded that they, that they rescind my nomination for keep for New Zealander of the Year in 2019. They will go to any lengths they use and they can afford to do it. They're, mm -hmm. they will, they're using 
search engine optimization to drown anything that um, any journal articles that we happen to get published. I mean, if you go into Google Scholar and you search, you know, for you want to find research, harm reduction research, you'll find that a lot of it is buried. They um, yeah. they're writing so many junk. It's just junk advocacy research. It's it's also controlling the algorithms too. So, I mean, basically right. it's the same thing that you were thinking last night is they should resign. They're useless, they're pointless, they need to resign. It, yeah, it's crooked, um, it's been co-opted and it's not just Bloomberg, it is the tobacco control prohibitionists um, have got in there. They get onto committees all over the place, any committee, um, any advisory group, uh, they go they lobby the members of parliament all the time. And now our Associate Minister of Health in New Zealand is from the same university, is a colleague of some of these people. Um, and, you know, well, what hope do you have to get an alternative um, voice or voice for the consumer or consumer advocate voice in there when you have a person who was a public health um, Doctor and I know. academic. I know, I know. I'm not, Jenna, I'm not saying I, you know, like that. Yeah, but it's just like, well, the they just stack. They just stack everything. There, it's stacked against. Yeah, Jenna, you know that the Philippines got the dirty ashtray award yesterday. Yes. <laughs> um, we love your people. We were very happy that they did that. Um, it gives us hope, especially considering where you were three years ago. What would you say, to the, not necessarily to the Philippine delegation, but to the WHO as a whole, what would you like to say to them? Just carry on with um, information dissemination about tobacco harm reduction. Um, they'll just have to press on. Yeah, yeah. Tobacco enough. harm reduction can, advocates, yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, I mean, the. The use of awards goes back quite a long time as well in tobacco control. Over the time, you know, there's been a lot of fake awards set up. It's another way to get media attention, to get some coverage. Also, it's a way of um, promoting people faster within academia. So there have been a lot of awards that tobacco control has created and given out to people. Uh, those awards will only go to people who sing from the same song sheet. So they recently gave an Australian white woman who's from the UK an award for all of her work she's done, reducing smoking or not reducing, but addressing smoking among Aboriginal women in Australia. Um, so, you know, what about me guys? 30 years history working on reducing smoking among indigenous people, but they couldn't give it to me because of, you know, all of the um, the defamation and Lin and identity Lamato, distortion. I need to interrupt you. I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you. Lindsay, do you have any final thoughts? Because I know you need to go. No, just thank you for having me on. And, you know, for everyone who's watching, you know, I know at times feel a little bit tough right now, but the good news is, is nothing's going to be decided at, you know, COP9 right now. So COP10, whole different story. We've got two years. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you for joining us. I know it's late. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful yeah, keep day. Keep up your fabulous work, Lindsay. Oh, wait. I got more coming out. Wait till you see Great. it. Okay. So, yeah, there's there, yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out in the next month and so. So, good. thank you. All right, darling. Good night. Good night. Bye, Lindsay. Jenna. Thank you, Jenna.